Happy New Year and welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're finally looking at Society, which premiered in London in 1989. I've mentioned Society quite a bit on this show, because I think it's one of those perfectly cult horror movies. You've got to be pretty deep into the genre to know and appreciate this film, which was the directorial debut of that old summer bitch Brian Yuzna. Lest you forget, Yuzna is the man who brought us the buggy Silent Night 4, both reanimator sequels, and both dentist films. This guy is all up in dead meat. Truth be told, I love society more than any of those movies. It's a paranoid, sleazy nightmare of class commentary, and of course, it's got the shunting at the end. What exactly is the shunting? You'll find out soon enough. But I do think this is kind of a sleepaway camp situation, where everyone knows and talks about the movie's ridiculous ending, even though the rest of the film is just as fucking weird. How do you like your tea? Cream? Sugar? Or do you want me to pee in it? It also gets gross, which is exactly what you should expect when Yuzna teams up with his favorite makeup artist, Screamin' Mad George, who goes by that moniker because he felt his birth name, Joji Tani, was just too boring. Mad sounds more crazier than crazy to me. Um, it's in the nuance thing. So, I said it's a Mad George. Is a good name. George's work has also been all over the kill count, usually seen in Usenus movies, but also in a couple of nightmare films. Written by Woody Keith and Rick Fry, who also wrote Bride of Reanimator and Silent Night 4, society tells the tale of Bill Whitney, the black sheep of the upper class Whitney family, who just can't help but feel like he doesn't belong. The Whitneys are part of a very crusty society in Beverly Hills, where parties are events and conformity is key. Things start to get extra weird after his sister has her coming out party, and Bill is left unsure as to who he can trust and what his family has in store for him. As I've said many times before, Society is a movie just too damn graphic for me to cover without a sponsor. I mean, chances are, this video is already age-restricted by the time you're watching it. Thankfully, Movement came through again, and it's because of them I'm able to make this episode. Movement, spelled MVMT, makes watches and sunglasses that are high quality but affordable, with sleek minimal minimalistic design. They just launched their new Element line featuring all new designs, so check those out as well as the rest of their products by going to mvmt.com slash deadmeat, which will give you a 15% discount at checkout. With that kind of discount, you can look like you're a member of upper class society without paying Beverly Hills prices. That's mvmt.com slash deadmeat for a 15% discount at Movement, the company that helped me show you all the shunting. Thanks, Movement. Let's see how many people get murdered and or shunted and get to the final kills of 2019. The movie begins at a mansion in Beverly Hills, the home of the Whitney family. Bill Whitney lives here, and he sweats his way through that 80s-tastic kitchen to grab himself a big old knife and hold it very irresponsibly. Bill is played by Billy Warlock, who is the son of stunt performer Dick Warlock, the guy who played Michael Myers in Halloween 2, and who was adorable when I interviewed him last year. Billy Warlock was actually in Halloween 2 as well, as the boombox kid Michael Myers runs into on the street. If only he had a boombox to wake him up right now, since apparently he's sleepwalking or something until he's found by his mother. The next day, he tells his psychiatrist that his whole life feels like a nightmare. He's scared of his parents, his sister, even the shrink himself, Dr. Cleveland. I, I feel like something's gonna happen. And if I scratch the surface, there'll be something terrible underneath. Like what, Billy? Like metaphor worms? Yeah, peer at those creepy crawlers, dude. Cause if you stare long enough, you'll start to see a title card. We live in one, bitches. The opening credits feature a falsetto voice. singing over some weird looking shit that you may not be able to make out right now, but that you'll come to understand a little later. Er, kind of. In the driveway of his mansion, Bill Whitney plays basketball with his best bud Milo, who's got a real weird way of joking around. 
Yeah, you're Mr. Perfect. You'll probably end up assassinating the president. Yo, Milo, you all right, ma'am? Bill's sister Jenny is getting ready for her coming out party, but first she's got to worry about what's coming out of her closet. It's a monster, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> nah, it's just her ex-boyfriend David Blanchard, who brother Bill has to drag out of the mansion. But not before Blanchy Boy says there's something weird going on with Jenny. Bill's parents, Jim and Nan, don't care too much for that Blanchard boy, but they certainly do love caressing on their teenage daughter. Daughter, don't they folks? I wonder what they think of Bill's basketball butt out there. Bill, wasn't that Milo outside? Uh, yeah, yeah, he was just gonna take me to... Oh, uh, okay. They don't think about him at all. Jenny's a bit warmer towards Bill than their parents, but maybe she better cool it down some, cause looks like her skin's boiling. Yowza! Man, that effect is almost as weird as this dialogue and line delivery. It's just uh, a little damp is all. <laughs> well, I'm not taking another shower. Yeah. Yeah. At school the next day, Bill participates in a class election debate against a poindexter named Marty, played by Brian Bremer, last seen on the kill count in Silent Night, Deadly Night 5, where he played Pino, the frustrated android with an Oedipus complex. I love you, Mommy! I love you! I love you! Might be tough for Marty to beat Bill when his personal cheering section consists of Heidi Kozak from Slumber Party Massacre 2. Marty's got the backing of the popular kids, though, so he has this chick Clarissa a Carlin distract Bill by appealing to his basic instincts. It throws Billy Boy off, because obviously. But Bill recovers from that crotch botch and comes back with some nerd jokes, which charms the student body over to his side. He wins the debate and a basketball game, but as Dr. Cleveland gets him to admit, that doesn't fix his family problems. We're just one big happy family, except for a little incest and psychosis. In fact, his family is so different from and unaccepting of Bill, he thinks he might be adopted. Doc Cleveland talks Bill down from that idea and delivers an ominous promise. You know, you really deserve what's gonna happen to you, you know. What's gonna happen? You're gonna make a wonderful contribution to society. Uh, cool. While getting suntan lotion from the bathroom at home, Bill sees his sister Jenny being weird through the shower door. What the fuck? Are her T's on the same side as her B? And what kind of noise is she making there? <laughs> Better check if she's okay. Oh. God, Bill, what's the matter with you? No, never mind. Probably shouldn't have done that, Billy. You were just complaining about incest, man. After checking in with his parents and their prized screaming garden slugs, <laughs> Bill takes off to go to the beach club, where he gets some sun with his girlfriend Shauna, Heidi Kozak's character. They get to making out, but she pauses their tongue boxing to demand that he get them invites to a popular party. Pretty standard normal scene. R Wait, what the fuck are those kids doing back there? Oh my god, Heidi Kozak, you are amazing. Bill crawls after the army boys, only to run face to legs into Clarissa, the panty flasher from school. She gives Bill a facial and returns the sunscreen to him before walking away and leaving him free to run into this rather large lady. Uh, okay, society. Bill talks to Ted Ferguson, the popular douche who's having the popular party that Shauna wants to go to. He doesn't give Bill an invite, though, which leads to Shauna's disappearance. Damn, man, lost your girl. But at least you've got your sister's ex-boyfriend? Looks like Bill and Blanchard are buddies, which is why he takes Bill down by the beach, boy, and plays him a tape of his family talking about Jenny's coming out party. First we dine, then copulation. With someone your own age first, then with your mother and me. Bill hears them mention Ted Ferguson as a mating partner and get into gross details that you just don't want to hear your sister talking about. It's so much fun to see how far you can stretch. Yeah. The hotter and wetter you get, the more you can do. Jesus Christ. The tape finishes with Jenny and Ted Ferguson squishing around together until it crescendos into sounds that are more than just their moans of pleasure. Blanchard obtained this audio from a mic he hid in Jenny's earring, but he didn't hide it very well since it's discovered by her father Jim while he's meeting with an important judge named Carter. Judge Carter is played by David Wiley, previously on the kill count, all the way back in Friday the 13th Part 3, where he played Abel, the replacement crazy Ralph who shoved a 3D eyeball into the camera. Whoa! Jim and Carter immediately figure out that Blanchard's to blame for the buggery and agree that something needs to be 
be done about him. Something more than a beach tackle, that is, which Bill delivers before taking the tape as evidence that his paranoid suspicions aren't unfounded. Unfortunately, Billy Boy and his board shorts takes the tape directly to Dr. Cleveland, who says he can't and won't listen to it right now. He gaslights Bill into leaving the tape with him, and the next day, Cleveland tells him that he must have been hearing things. Cause this tape, this tape right here, it's just a casual conversation between family members. First we dine, then introductions. Then you'll be presented. It's a bizarro version of the stuff Bill heard, but Cleveland tells him people are who they are, and that he's someone who needs to follow rules, not someone who makes them. It's a question of what you're born to. Bill calls Blanchard and arranges to pick up another copy of the tape, but on his way over, he comes across a pretty bloody car accident. Oh shit, is that Blanchard? Is he dead? Hey yo, answer the man, I need that information. I'm not gonna put Blanchard on the count right now, since these two pricks won't confirm the corpse to Bill. And also, you know, because I've seen the rest of the movie. Bill gets home and is presented with a telegram. It's an invitation to Ted Ferguson's party. <gasps> wow. Ha, huh, wow indeed. Sounds like some bash, son. But be careful on the drinking and driving. God damn, I love the Whitney's. They tell Bill that they know all about Blanchard's accident and demise, but they just don't really care. So, what are you gonna wear? If you mean to the funeral? No, you weirdo. To the Ferguson's party. Uh, I don't know. Khaki jacket and a mullet, I guess. Bill goes to Ferguson's party, seeking information about Blanchard, but he's down with a dance detour when Clarissa confronts him there. They're interrupted by Milo, who also wants to know what happened to Blanchard, but Billy too horny for that right now, and instead he follows Clarissa into a tent. There he finds Ted Ferguson, and shout out to actor Ben Meyerson for his magnificent scenery chewing every time he's on camera. It's friggin' great, man. Bill demands to know what happened at Jenny's coming out party, and Ferguson is happy to recall the schedule for him. First, we dined, then I fucked your sister. And then everybody else got so turned on, they fucked her too. Ferguson also says that he caused Blanchard's car crash, and when that sets Bill off, Ferguson just spits some Ren and Stimpy at him. You are stupid! They throw Bill into the pool like a big old nerd. No, I wasn't talking about you, Marty. And after he gets out, Clarissa picks his button and invites him to her room, where she's got black satin sheets waiting for him on the bed. Oh, uh, are we just doing this right now? Damn, yeah, they're jumping right into it. Pet names and all. Name me. Machine jelly bean. Wow, she even got a handful of bum there. Damn. This is a pretty erotic using a sex scene, which you gotta understand is fucking saying something, man. Bill can't even believe it. Unfortunately, it sounds like it was a bit too erotic for the actors involved. I was particularly um, uncomfortable with the love scene. Honestly, it was more uncomfortable for Billy because he had to do the orgasmic moment and everybody's very quiet and you got 20, 30 people watching you on the set. Billy Warlock, who had come from the much tamer world of soap operas, had a plan to get around it though, even though he knew the scene was in the script. I figured I'll deal with it when the time comes. I'll get the part and then I'll deal with it. And when I saw the shooting schedule, it was like, we shot that towards like, I think it was the last week in fact. Well, I knew then if I didn't want to do it, what was he going to do, fire me? I had three weeks of filming in the can. It's a nice trick. But anyway. That's what I did, and uh, so that's why they cut it, just as she starts to pull my underwear down. And not that I'm shy, I just don't really, I don't think I have a great ass, so why show it? As for Clarissa's actor, Devin DeVasquez, although she was a Playboy model earlier in the decade, that's not quite the same as shooting a sex scene. To be on a set with lots of people watching you simulate a sex scene, was a little bit daunting. But a Usna movie is bound to have a sex scene, and a Usna sex scene is bound to get weird. So it's no surprise when things end up contortional, with Clarissa MC Eschering in the bed. You, uh, you were in a funny position. Uh oh, guy, you're so sweet. Outside Clarissa's house, Shauna finds out about Bill's tryst thanks to her best friend Sally, played by Marie Claire of Slumber Party Massacre 3. Which, by the way, you can always watch that kill count if you're like bored or whatever. I mean, it's the only episode without a million views, but. It's you know, it's, it's whatever. Back inside, Clarissa offers Bill tea any way he wants it. Uh, do you want me to pee in it? Yeah, that's the way he needs it. Before they can commence with the water sports, though, they're interrupted by that large woman from the beach. Home a little early tonight, don't you think so, Mother? Wait, Mother? With, uh, 
Yeah? Okay. Mrs. Carlin here has grunts that are dubbed in by some dude, <coughs> and she's spitting up hairballs. So, yeah, you know, lovely lady. The next day, in his Jeep, Bill finds a Ken doll inside a sex doll's mouth, which is a delightful sentence to say. Shauna shows up and yells at him for sleeping with Clarissa, then after getting a look at that sex doll, she's done with this relationship ring, or whatever that was. Uh, super expensive getaway! Bill goes back inside and walks into a very confusing scene. Yeah, right there, Dad. That's good. No, that is not good, says Bill. But the weirdness only gets weirder, with Bill's mom saying he looks sexy, before both his parents finally express pride at what Bill's going to amount to in life. You know you'll make such a great contribution to society. This is all too much for Bill, who snaps and implies that Jim and Nan aren't his real parents. He even insults Jim to his face. Fuck you, butthead. Ugh, <laughs> shut up, Bill. Bill leaves them and goes to Blanchard's funeral with Milo, who gets a tad too touchy with the corpse on display. Gross. Marty suddenly appears out of nowhere and tells Bill the name of the movie he's in. Society. He also says he needs to tell Bill about his family, so that that night, Bill goes to meet the nerd on a canyon road. After parking the Hoopsmobile, he does indeed find Marty, dead in his car, his throat gushing blood. Oh no! Bill wanders around the woods until he sees a sweater in the trees and gets attacked by a guy in blackface. What? I don't know, maybe it was a ski mask. Before we get a second look, the dude gets away, and although Bill follows, it's to no avail. He instead winds up at Clarissa's house somehow, then leads her and a couple of cops into the woods, where, surprise, surprise, things are different than how we experienced them a minute ago. What are you hopped up on? The cops let him off with a warning of police brutality, and Bill spends the night with Clarissa in the back of his Jeep. Cozy! At school the next morning, Bill gets up on stage in front of the student body and announces that Marty is dead! Dun dun dun! And he was killed, just like Blanchard was, because both of them were trying to- Oh, hi, Marty! Would someone like to tell me what's going on here? Haha, <laughs> you fucking wiener, Marty. You smug fucking wiener. Milo tells Bill that he wants to help him, though he does admit to being the one who put a sex doll in his jeep. Why the dolls and stuff? I don't know. Yeah, fuck it. Let's just keep the movie going. That night, Milo waits outside in his car as Bill returns home to find his family, his shrink, and that Judge Carter guy all waiting for him there. They swarm him along with those EMT guys from Blanchard's crash and stick the poor kid with a needle of mm, drugs. Bill is taken to the hospital and Milo follows him there. And let me just tell you, he does not react positively when they tell him Bill Whitney's in the morgue. No, 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 no. Yes. Can I hear that again? No, no, no. No, no, no! Wait a minute. In reality, Bill's not in the morgue. He's in Dr. Cleveland's room getting drugged the fuck up. He wakes up to find a noisy operation going on right next to him. What's behind curtain number one, Bill? Nothing? Nothing? Tra-la-la? He leaves the hospital through the loading dock and finds Milo waiting for him at his Jeep. But Bill is now in a chemically induced state of acceptance. Things are just the way they seem, only more so, Milo. He's drugged up enough to think that he's won. He's free. But Milo points out that since he's legally dead now, someone's probably setting him up for something nefarious. Bill has a violent exchange with Clarissa as he demands that she explain it all, but the only thing she tells him is that things aren't how they seem and that maybe he should consider not going home tonight. But Bill's done playing around and says he's gonna go home anyway. It's time to party hardy! Milo will follow him there, and hey, might as well bring Mrs. Carlin along too, right? Just watch that hair around her. Bill gets home for the movie's infamously messy final act, which he'll get to just as soon as he's finished drinking slash spilling this glass of water. Right as he confronts his mom and dad, though, the lights flip on, cause this an ambush, motherfucker! From everyone in town, too. His parents, that cop, even the fucking nerd. And of course, his duplicitous psychiatrist, Dr. Cleveland. Wonderful! Everyone was just wonderful. Cleveland introduces Judge Carter, the man of honor for this whole damn party, which is why he'd be getting them mama smooches. But he's not here for cheek kisses, he's here for something else. I do love the smell of the hunt and the taste of the shunt. Oh shit y'all, we are so damn close to shunt o'clock. Bill's parents finally admit they're not his real parents, and Doc Cleveland confirms he was never really one of them. You're a different race from us, a different species, a different class. 
You're not one of us. So, no, Google Gobble? Bill calls them all aliens, but Cleveland denies the charge. And according to Yuzna himself, these members of society aren't extraterrestrials, but rather descendants of humans who were taken over by a parasite that turned them into a different species. So, that's what's going on here. Outside, Milo arrives with Clarissa's mother in the back, and together they watch as Clarissa herself rolls up to join the party, where Bill is paraded in front of the rich and their hors d'oeuvres are in fact slugs. Mm. The judge commends Bill's dad for his contribution to society and promises Ted Ferguson an internship in Washington. This high class society party is just about getting a tad too gropey when another person is brought in and thrown to the ground next to Bill. It's David Blanchard, and Judge Carter announces that he'll be the subject of the first shunting of the night. Bill will be the second. Let's finally see what's in store for you, Billy boy. It's Finally time to shunt! So, shunting looks like it involves lingerie and, uh, okay, it's- what? Is that honey? What's that? Uh, hey, hold on. Hey, what the fuck is that? Yo, is that a butt? And I, I don't even know, a, a jelly tumor? Yep, this is the shunting, folks. The reason I needed a sponsor for this episode. Cause I don't think YouTube is about to monetize all these people aardvarking into another person's melty skin. As Bill watches in horror, Ferguson explains the symbolism of the shunting to him. The Rich have always sucked off low-class shit like you. Pretty on the nose there, but Yuzna's own concocted backstory to this whole thing was a bit more developed. The screenplay for Society, as originally written by Woody Keith and Rick Fry, included all the paranoia we see, but was a much more straightforward bloody slasher. Yuzna added all the political and social commentary, and according to him, the shunting is a way for the inbred upper class of society to spike the gene pool, like you might use a mutt to keep a pure breed of dogs from getting too genetically messed up. Bill and Blanchard are, of course, the mutts in this metaphor. If that's a little confusing to you, don't worry, you're not alone. Um, I don't know if I completely got it. I didn't get it. After Blanchard's been sufficiently tenderized and warmed up, the judge gets his own special turn at the lab. Oh god, all this moisture. I, I think I'm gonna be sick. Judge Carter notes Blanchard's beauty mark before kicking things off with a pawn. And now... We'll get to the bottom of this. Wait, what does- Oh no! It's coming out of his head! Holy shit! Wow, man, George, you're a motherfucking nutbag! <laughs> yeah, get that shit on camera. This is home movie gold. Props to Blanchard's actor, Tim Bartell, for acting so horrified during this death scene that it's part of the reason they added Strauss's Blue Danube playing over it, just to try to make it a little less disturbing. Did it work? Probably not. But hopefully, the shunting lived up to your wildest imagination. And we're not done quite yet. Clarissa frees Bill from his restraints with a dramatic I love you, and he runs upstairs, where he's cornered by Doc Cleveland, sporting a Glasgow smile and a snare. Oh, and and a, uh, hand head. I really love the hand head, and it's hilarious to me that the idea originated in the self-portrait Screaming Mad George did when he was at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. Bill escapes into the bedroom and finds a somehow even more horrid sight. His mom in bed, all anatomically weird. Cause how else you gonna do a handstand on your feet? Oh boy, Bill, what do you think about this? That's your mom, dude. And your sister, too. I'ma lick ya. But it's Bill's father who gets the most memorable body horror treatment. Well, son, I guess you're right. <laughs> I am a butthead. <laughs> well, here's hoping my channel doesn't get some kind of strike. Hey, you know what? If it does, worth it. The butthead gag, like the head giving head in Reanimator, was meant to be a visual pun as pitched by Brian Yuzna. Uh, he wanted to have, uh, uh, the head and the butts and together. It fell on makeup artist Dave Grasso to sculpt, who did not see this job description coming. Yeah, you know, we're doing a monster movie, we're doing like something like Aliens or Predator or The Thing, something like that. And so what am I gonna be doing? He goes, you're gonna, you're gonna sculpt a butt. Bill says bye to uh, all that and goes back into the hallway where he's caught once again by Cleveland, who definitely does not rock. The doc brings him downstairs where things have degraded into various piles of what looks like a neural network or a bubblegum orgy, whichever you prefer. I feel like this scene right here is the single most distilled depiction of Brian Yuzna and Screaming Mad George 
George's aesthetics. Like, if you could just film inside their brains, I think this is what you'd see. Pretty fucked up, huh? The Shunting was originally written as a relatively straightforward bloody massacre, but unsurprisingly, Yuzna wanted to get weirder with it. He and Screaming Mad George used Salvador Dali as an inspiration for all this surreal imagery. Specifically, his paintings Autumnal Cannibalism, Soft Construction with Boiled Beans, aka Premonition of Civil War, and The Great Masturbator, which, yes, is the name of the painting. George had always been interested in Dali's expressionism, as his early artwork shows, but he was frustrated by the restriction of stillness inherent to paintings. It wasn't until he saw the special effects in both of the big 1981 werewolf films that he realized he could put that kind of body-morphing artwork into motion. My paintings, I couldn't express uh, something like that. You know, it has to be done with something with movable images. The first step to bringing the shunting to life was making maquettes and molds, which George would create by himself. Then he and the makeup artists on his crew, like Nick Benson and Dave Grasso, created the various large-scale sculptures that would actually be filmed for the scene. Due to budget and time constraints, though, George had to help with all of the sculptures, resulting in a hellacious sleep schedule of only three hours a night. That went on for the entire week it took to shoot the shunting, which the crew talks about as though it were a war they fought in. I was inside that shunting scene. But they also said it was a fun experience that everyone was pretty into. A dirty, disgusting, fun experience. Slathered in methasol, the food thickening agent you see getting slopped around everywhere. Which is apparently what they use in jelly donuts. I haven't had jelly donuts yet. Milo has snuck into the house by now, under disguise in a cop uniform. So he's there to witness Bill challenge Ted Ferguson to a one-on-one -on -one fight, where if Bill wins, they have to let him and Clarissa go. The terms sound agreeable, so let's get this fight underway, as soon as we put everyone back together again. Melt them down and reconstruct them, folks. It's fine if you're a little off with the cosmetics. Judge Carter acts as the ring announcer, citing society's lineage through Julius Caesar and Genghis Khan before ringing the bell and beginning this boy fight. Sadly, but realistically, Bill gets his ass handed to him by the much bigger and more athletic Turd Ferguson. Probably doesn't help that he keeps getting jeered at either. Shut the little bastard! Ferguson lifts Bill up and tosses him across the room, then beats him straight silly again before he tries to kiss and make up. But wait a minute, what's going on here? I think Bill's gaining the upper hand with weird bendy skin stuff. That's bound to cause a funny sound effect or two. <laughs> No, I did not add those with my editing. Those sound effects are in the actual movie. I don't know how, but Bill has turned the tide to win the fight. And I'm pretty sure a thumb out the mouth means death, right? Oh yeah, that's looking pretty deathy right there. Oh shit, especially when he turns him all the way inside out? Ferguson is definitely dead. And uh, turns out he's worms too. I'm not surprised. Though I was surprised to hear that the bugs in this scene grossed out Screaming Mad George. Yeah, this guy got grossed out by something. Milo pulls out a gun and uses it to part the blue bloods, even the tongue waggly ones, and although Bill's fake dad tries to stop him, Bill shuts that shit down with a punch and an insult. Butthead. Bill, Clarissa, and Milo all hop into Bill's Jeep, and the movie ends with the three of them escaping society. For now. How many mother shunters got killed in society? Let's find out and get to the numbers, right after I crack open a little bit of the bubbly. Oh. Oh fuck, uh, ah, uh, ha ha, happy new year! Only two people died in society, the bare minimum for a kill count. And with both of them dudes, that left a blueberry pie for Jason Biggs to practice shunting on. With a runtime of 99 minutes, we had a kill on average every 49.5 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to both of the movie's kills. You're not gonna get me to choose between a guy getting turned inside out and the screaming mad shunting. No siree. I'll give everyone an award. I mean, I am a millennial after all. And obviously, that means no doll machete. So that's it. Society premiered in London in 1989, but didn't get to the US until 92, where it received considerably worse reviews. Yuzno was disappointed since he was proud of what he made, even though he is candid about its faults. Well, 
you know, I wasn't the best director in the world on it. And the movie is kind of clunky. Thankfully, it's been reappraised in recent years and is recognized as the wonderful satire that it is. But that's it for 2019 here on Dead Meat. I had a blast making this year's 73 kill counts, and I hope you had just as good a time watching them. On Friday, I'll actually have a schedule announcement for you, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Gabriel M. Leon, thanks man, Joe Schinniger, Bromation, Rhonda Moonjed, Mara Cap Saratov, Rochelle Ruby, and Elias Wachter. And another huge thanks to Movement for sponsoring this episode. Be sure to check them out in the description. Thanks again for another awesome year, everyone. Be good people, and have a good year.